Ah, oh, excellent. I brought this up because I thought I might need it. Do you know, I'm actually quite nervous to follow Matthew Taylor because he is... He's a pretty good speaker. But anyway, and I am the last speaker on your, your 24, 48-hour event. How does that feel, everyone? <laughs> You're just lo waiting for the clock to go down and think, we should just shut the up and let us get out of here because it's, it's Feedback Friday, as they call it. Um, listen, I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. And um, despite the rain... Uh, we're in Wales or Manchester or Glasgow. They always rain when I go to those places. Um, Pranounda. Excellent. I've been working on that for, for all morning. Um, I have a long affiliation uh, with South Wales. My best friend of 35 years, uh, who's like my sister, her parents and family live in Baglan in Port Talbot or Port Talbot, depending which way you want to say it. And they live in the shadow of the steelworks. So um, I've been on a journey of 35 years of an adoptive family here in Wales, and that's where I will head. I have to leave it on time because hair appointment will finish sharply at half past two. So I've been told I have to rock up at this uh, tiny little hairdresser's. She's 88 uh, years of age. Her husband is 87, and they are currently living out the social care uh, adventure or crisis uh, in exactly the way uh, that uh, Matthew was describing earlier. God, I am nervous. i just take a little sip of this. You see, the thing is, this matters quite a lot. What we're all doing in this room matters. Matters more than most things that you probably will get up to during the course of a week. You have one of the most innovative things already here in Wales that I have been trying to get Scotland, Greater Manchester, and many other areas to just adopt and get on with it. Academy Wales, run by Joe Hicks, has got to be one of the most important and progressive developments in your public service. It exists nowhere else that I have ever worked. And no matter how often I try to get Jeremy Hayward, who I adored, he was my boss, the cabinet secretary for 20 years, John Manzoni et al., they won't take it on in England. They should just come to Wales, headhunt everybody that works for Academy Wales, and move them into Whitehall. And they're, they're, I know they're making their marches, but that's, that's Jeff's wife that's done that one. That's, that's his fault, Mr. Farrer, at the end. Yes, they came and claimed her. But the point I'm making is, you're all looking at the front to these people, the two gentlemen that spoke before me this morning, for innovation. And the, the, the irony is, you're sitting in something that's innovative, that is creative, and continues to do that day in, day out. And I do just want to briefly say... Good luck to Jo Hicks. She's been an extraordinary leader of Academy Wells, and I think she's somebody, as a daughter of the Welsh Public Service, you should be immensely proud of her. So thank you, Jo. <laughs> so I, I have a view, which is um, we can't necessarily stop the pouring rain that creates a flood. We can't necessarily stop a white supremacist going into a mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand and gunning people down in cold blood. We can try, but we can't. We can't necessarily stop what's happening right now with Turkey and uh, North Syria. We're sitting here now whilst another global crisis is happening. We're sitting here in this stadium in Wales. But you can choose here in Wales. That's the irony of ironies. You can choose here in Wales. You have more power than many people in England. You have more power sometimes than the guy, Sadiq, the wonderful Sadiq Khan, who is running London. And so for me, the interesting thing about here is that you shouldn't see yourselves as outsiders trying to figure stuff out in a conference. You should see yourself as the insiders of Wales that can take control. You've got the minister here. You've got the head of the civil service here. We've got an extraordinary delegate list in the room. And if you don't go home and take some responsibility for the public service in Wales, then who, who, who are you looking to do that? Who are you looking for? Look to thyself to create the change that you want in Wales. Be determined and be deliberate, but look to yourselves. Look at this room. 
quite a lot of white people in it. Dare I say it, one person of colour, I think. Let's change that to reflect Wales. Let's talk about some of the difficult things. I could feel the room go like that when I did that. A little bit of that went on. I'm sure my friend over there is feeling even more awkward, but she's smiling at me, which is a good thing. We go back. So what I'm trying to say is we all have some responsibility at the same way that as members of the public we have responsibility to each other. And we are in all circumstances stronger together. We are stronger together. And that's what Academy Wales does for you. That's what the Welsh Government can do for you. And that's what you can do as public sector leaders. Now, I've been asked to reflect on my life and things that I've got up to. But I want to say at the beginning, I'm just like Matthew. You know, you get some things right, you get some things wrong. And we all do. And there's no point standing here saying, you know, I might have a dame now, that's great. My mother would have died and gone to heaven. She, is, she has died and gone to heaven. Uh, but I hope she's in heaven. Oh, uh, <laughs> I dodged you on that one. Anyway, moving on swiftly from that. Um, uh, the, the, you know, so you can say, oh, yeah, you, she's done all these things. It's all great. I've made huge numbers of mistakes. Once I used the F word 17 times in front of the researchers at a police conference because I was told to be funny. I ended up in the, uh, in the day Daily Mail in the most humiliating, I was hum I humiliated myself. It was the most ridiculously stupid thing that I ever did. Did I learn from it? Did I? But anyway, there we are. Um, and now I can say it all I like because I'm no longer a serving civil servant. So you can put on the feedback form, whatever you want, but you know, I can do what I want nowadays. So two years ago, I stepped out of the civil service, a civil service that I loved, a civil service that I adore. Um, uh, I know a lot of people have views about the civil service, but I loved doing that for 20 years. I was always an outsider on the inside and an insider on the outside. Depends which hat I wanted to wear and what it was we were trying to achieve. But in the last couple of years, I've had a bit of time just to really think about some things and about some things that I think probably we could do better how much the political landscape has changed, we all think it's since 2016, when a vote happened, I understand, that we're still fighting about three years later. But actually, if you think back, I arrived uh, from the charity Shelter to be the government's homelessness czar in 1999. And whatever you think about Tony Blair, and I saw the reaction in the room, Whatever you think about Tony Blair, whether you like him or whether you hate him, what is really interesting is that for a full decade, we had one Labour government with essentially one direction, cohesive, determined, and it moved forward. Domestically, it was an extraordinary decade that people knew where they were. One prime minister over one decade. Subsequently, we've had at least three to five prime ministers in the subsequent decade, and we're probably still counting. We've had three significant referendums. We only ever talk about Brexit, but we actually, we actually almost lost Scotland. You know, not insignificant moment for me anyway. All of which these things have changed. Let's think about referendums for a moment. In post-war Europe, we don't decide things by referendums. And yet nowadays we do. Not just Brexit, but actually look at the vote on gay marriage that went the right way in Ireland, our sister country over the way. Look at these things. In Australia, they also did a referendum on gay marriage that went the right way. So these things are fascinating to me, that these are changing. And yet we think about what's happening this week and what's happening this moment. And we should think about what's been happening over the last couple of decades. If you add in things like the economic crisis, the austerity agenda, people like Trump and those other three that the professor had up this morning, God knows I think it's hard to keep up with the pace of each month, each week, each day, each hour. And at the moment it feels each minute about what is happening in UK politics. We don't even know what's happened this morning in terms of what's happening in terms of the Brexit vote. On top of that, you've got seismic domestic events like the major terrorism attacks in London and Manchester that we've almost forgotten about and moved on, as if they didn't happen. The, the, the thing that will put Manchester back on the map is going to be a public inquiry where we might find out some things that, that we might have been able to predict that that might have been prevented. Somebody decided, for whatever reason in their brains, that they were going to pick that particular event so they could make a particular moment about girls not dressing properly. 
oh yeah, these are hard things. I've been, I've been wondering about whether to do something called tough talks, sod TED talks. Let's talk about some of the tougher issues. And so you add into that the Grenfell Tower disaster. That's the only way you can describe what happened before, what happened during, and what's happened since. There's nothing to write home about there, about the public sector and how we stood together and tried to handle it. There's an extraordinary story to be told of the people that are now trying to turn it around and make it a better place. And some of my colleagues from local government and elsewhere. The reversal of extraordinary domestic wins of a decade ago, like real reductions in child poverty, we're now turning in the opposite direction. Historic low levels of antisocial behaviour, and one very close to my heart, the numbers of human beings forced to sleep out on our streets. It gave me just pain last week to watch the ONS statistics uh, say that it's an average of two people a day die on the streets in England. And yes, I know 55% of those are people who are using drugs. They might have died in a squat or they might have died in a flat, but they died on the street. But it's still two people a day. It's extraordinary. The last street count, and I know street counts, some people like them, some people dislike them, but we used them for quite a long time and we still use them now. The last street count in England and Wales, I think, was 532. The text that came through to that phone for London was something like 324. Last year, 732 people died on the streets of England and Wales. Yeah, we're not getting everything right, are we? And actually, if you think about it, I ask myself, why did that unravel, Louise Casey, after you'd left? What happened? What didn't you get right that meant that the institution, the, the, the lived experience would just continue. They stayed low for a decade and they've gone back up since 2010. And I ask myself, in fact, you can even hear it in my voice, I feel mortified and ashamed that I didn't do a good enough job to make sure that people didn't die on the streets in this country. And that's why I'm back doing stuff on homelessness because it's almost atonement. So yes, I've, walked for, I've worked for four prime ministers, and yes, throughout that time, I've tried to do the right thing, from the homelessness there, through to crime and antisocial behavior, the victims commissioner, which was an extraordinary privilege, the troubled families program, the time in Rotherham inspecting the local authority in, uh, around child sexual exploitation, and more latterly, the, the review into our most isolated communities, which is in the graveyard in Whitehall, buried away somewhere because it's just too bloody difficult for the government to do anything out. That is one of the reports that has just dropped out of the public domain. Sometimes these roles have been difficult. Sometimes they've tested my faith in our innate kindness and goodness but they've been a privilege and a privilege to undertake and be part of. Part of that privilege comes from doing the work by listening to what's happening in those communities, getting under the skin of problems, trying to work out what's happening, try to go to the core of what the beginning of that person's journey is to give voice to some of our most powerless citizens in our society, to listen, to care for those without homes, families made vulnerable by their problems, or the teenage girl who is now 30, who had been groomed and abused in the streets and the parks of Rotherham, to challenge the system and indeed society that has too often closed its ears and eyes and walked on by, the choice to do what is right rather than what is easy. Doing right doesn't always make you popular. Doing right doesn't always make you the person that everybody wants at the meeting, but doing easy is often the wrong call. So much is about the importance of bravery and being brave. Now, by bravery, that doesn't always mean some macho kind of behaviors of arguments and conflicts and doing all of that, no. It's about truth to power. And actually, that's simply about holding up a mirror and showing people what's in that mirror. Most of the time, when people take a moment to look in the mirror, they know what they see. That's all this is about, truth to power. You already know it. I, yeah, it's fascinating this. When I, when I first left, I thought, oh, God, I better do a website and, you know, I better have an email. No, nobody will ever employ me again. It's going to be an absolute disaster. Why did I think this was a sensible thing to do? And I thought to myself, you know, what's that? What's going to be like? Call Casey when you know to come and state the bleeding obvious, but you want somebody to come and state it for you. 
I'm no KPM. That was a joke, incidentally. If you don't laugh at that, if you don't laugh at that, you don't laugh at any of my material. I mean, I've got, I've got screeds to get through yet. But, you know, I want to you know, call Casey, state the bleeding obvious. Uh, you know, I had a whole series of things, and then I thought better of it and thought I wouldn't do a website at all. I often get asked to speak uh, about truth to power, actually, as if it's some 21st century management technique out of an MBA. Do you remember MBAs? Did we have a moment? Come on, most of you in the room are old enough to remember MBAs, so there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, um, I do think this innovation and the word nudge is fascinating as well. So uh, Sean will know this. There's a place in Great... Matthew Paris Street in Westminster, and it's like a wooden panelling. So it's all very old-fashioned cabinet office. And in it is this place called the Nudge Unit. So people like Matthew and Charlie Ledbetter and Hilary Cotton and all of those very brainy people, they all go to places like the Nudge Unit. And then you kind of, you work out, you know, if anybody stayed in a hotel last night, you'll have the thing on the, on the thing now that says, you know, if you want to save the planet, uh, you know, d please put your... Don't put your towels up, do that. That's called nudging. It's a whole technique. There's a whole little team in the cabinet office called the Behavioural Insights Team. Anyway, I go along to it because they want to hear, you know, keeping it real. They thought they'd talk to me. So I go along and the room is full of like people that they've just walked out of In the Thick of It or W1A or Olympics 2012 or Channel 4. It's like I was so intimidated. There's like goatees everywhere. I can say that now. And, you know, square glasses, goatees. Oh, my God. Probably sandals in the middle of winter. I don't know what was going on in that room. Kind of the collective brain power was terrifying. Anyway, so I walked in and there's some sort of um, perspex, two little seats at the front. And I looked at that. I thought, I'm not sitting on that I'll fall, I'll fall straight over on that so I leant gently and I said listen I've had a thought about all of this you know I, you're right Jim. when you set up a shove unit you give me a ring and I'll come back come on that's funny that is seriously funny come on come on Dawn French yay um oh my god that ego's got out of control um yeah oh he's laughing now thank god so um I think it's asking not only why, ki why kids carry a knife when a crime occurs, which we spend a lot of time asking ourselves that question. I think the Metropolitan Police ask themselves on a regular basis, why when some child is knifed in the street will nobody come forward and give evidence? That is a much, much more difficult question to ask. Why, uh, for example, those running drug cartels, which is the only way you can explain what's happening in the drugs industry, is that these are cartels. If any of you watched uh, that thing about Baltimore, we now have it here in this country, the county lines, as we call it, which is an unintelligible line to the public. Why do those drug cartels do a better job of grooming kids than the families, communities, and services there to keep them safe? Why in Rotherham did the girls feel more loved by the men that groomed, tortured and abused them than by us? Why? Why as corporate parents? Why as any type of parent? Why as any type of community? I had to sit with the guy that took the refuse away from one of the children's homes and asked himself, why, why, when he could see condoms on the floor and all those sorts of things and he didn't come forward and many, many years later, he sat in a hotel room with me with his head down. And he's just the guy. He's the dustbin man. He's the refuse collector. And he knew. And he has to live with that every day of his life. Why, why are we letting criminals be cleverer than us? And that's a tough question. But it's a tough question that we should ask ourselves. I used to say relentlessly that the solution to rough sleeping is neither cheap, easy, or basic, and it's more than a cup of soup. You know, at, at any, you know, at every time, Lincoln's in fields, posh area in London, it's all being gated off now, but it used to be like tent city. And on Tuesday night, in one hour, seven different soup runs would turn up. And would they work with each other, or would they not? Do you, when you leave here and go back home and you see somebody begging outside a cash point, do you give them money or don't you give them money? These are the things that the public need our help with. I say now you can't arrest your way out of crime. Preventing crime is as powerful as dealing with the symptoms. 
tender is as important as tough. We met a government target on rough sleeping. It's extraordinary to think about it now, but we reduced the number of people sleeping rough in England by two thirds down to about 500 to 1,000, and it stayed that way for a decade. That's great. The current government is just playing a numbers game. They're just throwing money at the problem, and all they're concerned about is numbers. We met the target on rough sleeping because we reached for the vulnerable. We reached for the people that nobody had had the money to help before. We put money into drug treatment. We put money into mental health spaces. We took money and bought priory home rehabilitation for a tiny number of them because we knew we had to get them away and permanently. We delivered it because we wouldn't accept terms like won't engage as if homelessness was the person's problem and that it would always exist by asking some prison governors to stop homelessness before the uh, offender exited the prison gates. So I could tell you at that time, the prison in North London discharged on a Friday, thereby handing them over to the drug dealers, and the prison in South London, they came out on a Monday and we had a fighting chance to get them. Now we can all sit here saying we should run 24 hour services, yeah, we should be able to do that, oh, blah, blah, blah. No, no, let's be realistic. So one small change actually gave us a fighting chance on homelessness. So yeah, you can do prevention. You can spend 25 years researching uh, the, the, the bleeding obvious, which is these people have tougher lives than many of us in the room. And homelessness can happen to anybody up to a point. It's disproportionately more likely to, to happen to people that don't have stability and don't grow up. Two years on the streets of London, 10% of that, but that's the highest, that's, that's the worrying figure. The worrying figure is that 2,000 of that 5,000 have been on the streets for more than two years. And wait for this one, folks. This press aren't talking about this because they're going numbers. Dame Louise, the numbers up, numbers down, the numbers up, the numbers down. Brokenshire, the new guy, I've forgotten his name, uh, Jenkinson, something like that, who's running uh, MCHC. They ring me up, numbers are going down, numbers are going up. And I go, hey guys, two years, 2,000 people, and 10% of that cohort are ours. Because 10% of that cohort have been in care, then they've been to prison, and now they've been out on the streets for two years. That's, that's where looking at a problem differently really matters. And that's where actually challenging the system as in, is incredibly important. So, knocking the heads together of the two largest day centres in London, both run by different religions and therefore didn't talk to each other in quite the same language, closed for the same six weeks every summer. I can assure you, if you've got a foot problem that's smelly and you're out on the streets, it gets infectious very, very quickly if you're stuck in the heat. It's as bad as being in the cold. I would say counterintuitively, if you really want to get stuff done, often start with the hardest first, not the easiest. It's countercultural. Uh, quite often, uh, I've worked for many politicians. You've got good politicians, including one in the room, but let's be realistic. They often want easy wins, quick hits, great press notices. Working out how you deal with that 10% of that 2,000 who are still young is a lot harder than what Andy's doing in Manchester, which is at opening... Uh, day centre after day centre, property after property, and putting mattresses on the floor. I'll, I'll take that in the short term, but that won't deal with that 10% cohort. It's not about metaphoric low-hanging fruit, but building real trust and real momentum by sorting out uh, what, what really needs to happen. John came off the streets. He was a legend. The day he came off the streets, everybody talked about it. Everybody talked about it. It was an extraordinary moment because we knew, as a system, we had reached in and helped one of the most vulnerable people stuck out there on the streets. And yes, he was middle-aged. Yes, he was white. And yes, he had been an ex-serviceman. We, we often forget, as a system, who we're there for. When I was the anti-social behaviour czar, I was determined to stop the madness of youth centres always closing on Friday nights. Come on, you know this to be true. Deep down in your soul, you know this to be true. This is a true story. There I am in Ed Ball's constituency. He's the guy that decided he didn't like uh, family intervention. So I've got, I know he's now a national hero since he did Strictly. But there's a bit of bad blood there between me and Ed Ball's, actually, if truth be told. Um, and there are, anyway, so I was in his constituency. It's a Wednesday. I'm up the cop shop. The cop shop says to me, oh, geez, Louise, it, Friday night here is jumping. It's like, 
everybody's out there, the kids are out there, really worried about it, nobody listens to ours, da da da. Anyway, go around this day, day, uh, uh, youth centre for kids. It's one of your beautiful ones. So it's got a little bit of uh, old church, and it's got this nice new build that you know, new lay people have paid for. Obviously, this is one of the areas that was probably city challenge, Mm, come on, yeah, there are a few, if you remember City Challenge. Single regeneration budget, yeah. Uh, New Deal for communities, yeah. Neighbourhood renewal, yeah. Some of my own together action areas, respect areas, I've had a few of those as well. This has been in all of them. So I go around the youth centre, they you know, introduce me to kids who've got ASBOs just in case I'm awkward, and I go, what did you do to end up on an ASBO? So, oh, come on, it's quite funny. I mean, I don't do respect, do you know what I mean? It's like, are you, this is what it is, whether it's in a day centre with the homeless or whether it's with kids. Anyway, I'm sat there, you know, being cool, sitting on the end of the settee, and I said, oh, you know, um, how come, how could they, apparently it's a bit jumping in here on a Friday, it's like... Uh, yeah, it's all good. And you're, you're not open on a Friday. And this guy went, well, the thing is, Louise, the kids go drinking on a Friday, so there's no point. <laughs> yeah, it takes a while to get that joke. I did it, in, I did it at, at a conference where Spanish was the language. And about five minutes later, the room laughed. A bit louder than you, actually. But, uh, you know, I don't know where I was, but there I was. So the point I'm making is that sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's really difficult. But actually, opening on a Friday night as a youth centre is really easy. But actually, because we're all terribly awkward about it, sometimes I worry about these partnership things. It's like, you know, I, uh, I was doing something about care, uh, care for 16 and 17-year-olds, and everybody in Essex in the partnership knew that these buildings were the wrong place to house them, but they were all friendly with each other and had all been in the jobs for bloody years, incidentally. No lots of movement. I don't know what he was saying yesterday, but you know, they all knew each other. They all semi-socialised with each other. It was all too nice, and they all knew. They all knew that we were taking kids and putting them at 16 into places run by a security service where they were groomed and trafficked from that same address. They got to it when they could call it grooming and trafficking, but they didn't get to it when it was actually about a vulnerable 16 and 17 year old that was the challenging and too hard to help group, so they stuck them there. So the point I'm making without the joke is that we have to somehow reconnect to our purpose. We have to connect the system back to the purpose in the first place. In every job I've done, I actually start by getting on a train to go to the places where people live, to go and walk the streets, to listen to people, to not just go out with the public sector, but everywhere, to put the human experience back into a system that we've almost actively set out to dehumanise. I think if we knew that the 15 minutes that, that we are getting is exactly the scenario that Matthew talked about earlier, I think it would hurt us so much as public service people, we wouldn't really like it. So therefore we call it something else. It's like John was a person, yet he was on a case file as a number because we were depersonalizing John. During my time in the civil service, I've sat through presentation after presentation, seen strategy document after strategy document, where often I think we make the system uh, depersonalize our interaction. And I think sometimes it's putting the person, their humanity, their frailties, their real life experience, right at the very center of the services that we provide. We had a good shot at that with the Troubled Families Program, uh, a, a program that wanted to reach out to over 100,000 vulnerable families in England by getting under the skin of the problems they faced. But we, we believed, and that's all of us, both from the civil service, the colleagues in local government, the colleagues in the community sector, we believed that they wanted themselves, these families, their lives to be better. They wanted to get their kids to school. They wanted to get jobs, and they wanted to have the same kind of lives as you and I. The workers believed in those families and worked with them to make this so. I think it's fascinating that when we think we rock up, this woman said to me once, I can almost smell a social worker. Poor social workers, I adore them. But anyway, yeah, I can almost smell a social worker as they come with her clipboard. So instead of saying, how are you today? They say, you know, things like capacity, willingness to change. They use a language that's different. It's not let's stick the kettle on. We're, we're, we're sitting there assessing. We assess and assess. And there'd be more people in Baglan assessing uh, 
than actually doing. We're pretty, pretty long on assessment in all our public services because we're frightened if we get that wrong, somebody will rain down on us from a great height, whether it's an inspector at your boss or someone else. We're, we're rigid with fear, so we assess and assess and assess. I mean, dear God alive, I mean, children's services. In families in this scheme had eight very significant problems. So you guys in the room know this stuff. This is about education, health, domestic violence, child protection. Most social policy experts will tell you two of those problems can derail a family. Eight, eight uh, actually holds them back generations. That's where you get intergenerational disadvantage. One for Jeff, as ex-cop uh, in the room, 48% of these families had had a priest call out in the preceding six months. That's an extraordinary figure. It is, it, it, as uh, the guy that used to run Greater Manchester said to me, Louise, I could give you a cop that could sit on their settee 24 hours of the day because they're costing me that much. So it's a fascinating uh, scheme. Uh, as as, as, as uh, Matthew said, the first evaluation that was highly politicized didn't find that it worked or not worked. It, it, the, the, the five of the six reports said it was great. The sixth report said, it, it's, we're not, you know, it's, it, we can't prove that it's this that's worked. At which point, number 10 uh, just threw it to the wall. Uh, they briefed the Times, uh, front page of the Times, Trouble Families, uh, a total failure. I had David Cameron ringing me up. I was going to be like, you, you go out and defend it. I'm still working for them. It's like, come on, you go and defend it. But nobody defended it. I was silenced because it was a different time. Uh, number 10 decided that's how, and it was one of those casualties of politics. But it was the moment I knew I'd had enough. It was the moment I knew that I was letting down those families, and I was more importantly, in a way, letting down the tremendous workers that gave their lives to try and help these families. Amazing that the next evaluation that came out was really clear, looked after children uh, down by 32%, adults going to prison 25%, juvenile convictions, all good, all good, and indeed some of them getting jobs. Extraordinary program. And we came so close, so, so close to actually going across governments. It was like the move from Blair to Brown was exactly the same. Blair was into, uh, what was it called, family intervention. Brown took over, the scheme changed. And that's why, so I'm trying not to look at you, Minister, but that's why you're so important. And that's why what you do is so important, because it's life-changing. You give them life-changing. And that gets to the people in Wales. And that can only be a privilege and a great thing. So um, I will just tell you one other thing about this, actually, is uh, this just, just note to self here, Casey, don't get upset today, because it's Joe's last uh, thing. There I am in Nottingham, sat right with the family inter intervention worker alongside uh, this woman, the woman not quite as nice clothes as mine, but she was my type of size lady. And uh, Trouble Family's mums are either very thin or they're my size because they're not happy. <laughs> there you go, that's an assessment done on the job. <laughs> Uh, that's five hours' work of assessment. <laughs> Pop that to the Quality Care Commission, will you, for me, Joe? On you go. Anyway, I'm sat there. It's all very lovely. You know, I'm getting what you guys would get. You're all really senior in the room, so somebody introduces you to a great case and chat it through, and you get to see the best prisoner, the this, the that, you know, the IT suites, all of that stuff. Anyway, so I'm sat down. This woman, she looks across at me and she says, yeah, yeah, um, I call her my family interference worker. I thought, oh, I love her. Oh, my God. So this woman wanted interference. She wanted a positive authority figure. This woman had 10 children. She was uh, about to be evicted from her home. She'd have multiple partners. OK, so what happened was she was about to be evicted and she had her last chance. She's referred to this family intervention interference project. And the magic of this is incredible. So she says this story about, um, showed me the, 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 her before and after pictures. The before pictures was her back garden had every single white good in the estate in it. Come on. So it's like trash. And she looked at me and she said, this thing is I couldn't keep on top of the recycling, Louise. I thought recycling my arse. So we had a good laugh about that. 
And then um, the case worker says to me, the, th the thing is, um, we were evicted. Why were we evicted? Well, they kept finding the internal doors unscrewed and put in the back garden. And every time the housing people came back, put the doors on the thing, they'd come back, let another inspection, they'd be outside. And we, that, you know what it's like, evictions like that, you've got to have lots of evidence for it, and it often boils down to, it's like disciplinaries, you know, did you or did you not buy the milk? You know, it's that thing, you, 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 you know, that, and it, it all boils down to one thing. You're at the IT and you're talking about, you know, I'm only joking. <laughs> the kids in the house kept taking the doors off, unscrewing them, and putting them in the back garden. And the reason they did is because they knew that the latest man in the house, probably one of their dads, was less likely to beat the out of their mother if he could be seen. And we were about to evict her. She was a domestic violence case writ large. And the people protecting her were those children that saw through the whole thing. And do you know what? The family interference worker heard that story in a different way. And she therefore wasn't evicted and she went on to have nice hair, nice teeth, and actually to get a job. It's an extraordinary tale of the best of public service. Somewhere in everything that you do here in this room, today, this Friday afternoon, in Wales, there'll be one of your people somewhere doing that magic. And your job is to think about that and to talk about it and to be proud of it. That is the best of public service in my view. It's to facilitate and allow and breathe life into those interactions. And that's the privilege of the work that all of us have. But we can't deny we haven't always got this right. None of us want to keep going back to the same estates, the same homes, the same families, seeing the same misery every single year. I think sometimes we went about this the wrong, wrong way round. We wanted to tackle poverty on the poorest housing estates, and in response, we put money into buildings, into lighting, and into landscaping. We decided we wanted to prove outcomes for children, so we set up centres and hoped the needy would come to their doors. We wanted to reduce domestic violence, but instead of tackling the learnt behaviour of the father, we gave his partner bars on the windows and panic buttons. We missed something. I'm not suggesting any of that work wasn't good. The issue is, was it good enough? And we missed our biggest asset, which is humankind. Lem Sasse, uh, who is a poet that um, had uh, lived in care, talks about the three weeks when nobody touched him. And when he first said this, I, I was I, not long after Rotherham, you know, you're sort of living what touch means, if you see what I mean, and I like jarred with it. And what he meant was nobody had given him a hug as a kid. Nobody had put their arm around him. Nobody had checked whether, nobody had done that. I'm so tactile, I, I hug and kiss people all the time if I like them, even if I don't like them actually. <laughs> Depends how I'm feeling, it's Friday, you know, it's, it's hug day. Um, but it's, it's fascinating that our system deprived a child in care of anybody putting their arm around their shoulder. I was in Singleton Hospital with dad and I was, I was watching, because I was in there all the time and we were there for ages. And one Sunday I thought, sod this. So I went out to Joe's and I got a Joe's ice cream in thing, lots of little Joe's ice creams. I took them back in. I wanted some. <laughs> Let's just be clear. I was going to Joe's for Joe's ice cream. You don't get to be, you know, I work at it. I work at it, team. Uh, I can laugh at that. Any of you laugh at that? I can take them out of me. Yeah. yeah, I think we could, we could do it. You can laugh at it. So that, and you just saw this guy's face light up. He just, he lit up. Nobody had been to visit him in the entire time me and Judith had been in that hospital. And actually, I had to steel myself not to cry. Because it's so grim, the loneliness in some people's lives. And that's, that's the power that you have here in Wales as public sector leaders, is to do something about that. I don't feel the same about England. England feels indescribably too difficult and too big and too complicated right now. It's living out its own polarization of politics. We're living it out. And I know you might feel some of that here in Wales, but the struggle in England is huge. The mountain to climb is massive, but we can make an old guy smile in a hospital ward with a bit of Joe's. I mean, the, the nurses got in as well, actually. <laughs> Rotherham. 
Rotherham, I have to talk about it. Strong and purposeful leadership can be an enormous force for good, but a lack of leadership, the failure to tackle things because they're too hard, can have a catastrophic impact on people's lives. Nothing, nothing in my career has, 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 has touched the sides of how I feel about Rotherham and what happened there. We went following Alexis Jay's extraordinary groundbreaking report into, ch into child sexual exploitation. On arrival, everyone, members and officers to the same, told me about the award ceremony that they'd had for trimming motorway hedgerows. They'd done down and picked up an award in London. That was their opening gambit, and I was following Alexis in. They showed me the cupboard in their brand new, purpose-built, public sector, wonderful, uh, you know, recycling, pods, you name it, glorious civic center, which had award after award in it. Be careful, be careful about awards. Quickly, we worked out that they had spent unlimited amount of money on training people in social care, children and adult, on how to deal with inspectors. They were so concerned about the 38 uh, inspections that had happened in the preceding few years. They spent money on training people in how to deal with inspectors and inspections. Yet they had a capped budget for children's services and a very, very, very capped uh, 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 budget for their child sexual exploitation team. I didn't really need to know much more than that. It spoke volumes, and I was gutted on behalf of the public sector. I was gutted on behalf of us, that people there had lost their way or were too frightened. I'll come to what I think happened in a second, but they are us. And anyone in this room that thinks that they are not capable of doing that, go home and look at yourself in the mirror. That could be us unless we stay checked. I was expecting to find a local authority, a police force, a health service, all racked with guilt, wanting to learn the lessons of what had gone wrong, and instead I found denial. Denial of a problem due to fear that being honest would have too tough implications. Denial of the reality of what was happening to children and in communities. Children's care files from uh, the, the, the brown ones that they still had, uh, that I, I went through, we sheep dipped and did sample files. They literally had tipexed out the word Pakistani because they were so concerned about what that would mean. Did they think they were helping anybody Pakistani in Rotherham by doing that? What, what, what got into their minds? This is a town where if you're a woman in a headscarf who's Muslim, it's almost impossible to walk through the town centre. The English Defence League were there every single week that I was in Rotherham. Every single week. I looked at, what's that other lot called? Farage's party. He stood for the police crime, one of them stood for the police crime commissioner. And they had the picture of this terribly vulnerable white girl on their poster signalling to everybody racist terms because we were in denial about what was happening in Rotherham. We were in denial about what was happening in Rotherham. Not helping anyone at all, including the wonderful Pakistani heritage Muslim community in Rotherham. We were letting them down doubly. Denial by the police and public services of what's happening right under their noses. Tolerating underage pregnancies and sexually transmitted diseases in very young girls with older men on their files referred to as decent boyfriend. Denial of the fact that these girls were victims, not wayward teenagers asking for it. Denial that child sexual exploitation was a crime. I, I've struggled even wanting to call it exploitation when it's actually abuse. They may be 13, 14 years of age, but they're still children. It's like, dear God, from the licensing of the taxis to the houses that the children are abused in, to the schools that they didn't turn up to, these children and their lives were the responsible in Rotherham of everybody in this room. We let them down. It was a terrible, terrible failure. I've had a long time re to reflect upon it, 
and, and what I heard and saw in Rotherham pains me still. What pains me most is how we, decent, good, honest public servants, whether we're political or non-political, whether we're officers, whether we're members, whether we're the guy that took the bins or the social worker that didn't call the police or the police officer that decided to arrest her rather than arrest the, the abuser in the car. It's just relentless. It's relentless. And I've had to work out why I think this happens because it's not the only place that it's happening and it's not the only place where these issues we're in denial about. And I think it's like a dial that keeps moving. I don't think any of those people I interviewed, I don't think the social worker who is now living in the Southwest that could barely breathe because she was so distressed. She was so distressed. She was so distressed by the J report. And I thought to myself, and I continue to feel this, that it's like a dial of acceptability and unacceptability. And it moves so slowly, we don't even realize it's happening. You know, uh, one day uh, the, the care files had words like um, teenager, uh, but three months before it would have been child. We all know the difference between adolescent and teenager. We know the inferences we're making when we call somebody a child, when we call them an adolescent, and then when we call them a teenager. Teenage girl, short skirt, tit showing. What's that then? That's wayward, isn't it? We know the, the, the expressions like broken home and decent family. We know because we write them on things. We tap them now into computers. We've got things called boyfriends that are actually 26-year-old men that drive a Merc with blacked-out windows and drops them at the STT clinic and waits for her outside. And we call him a boyfriend in the file. And then we go to what we would all think, if it was our 13-year-old daughter, we would think that she is raped and it will be written on a file as consensual sex. And then this is a true story of somebody that I have interviewed that lived through this experience. On her 13th birthday, her group of abusers said that they raped her repeatedly in a park and did other things to her. And they said to her, nobody will ever believe you because you are consenting to sex with us. And nobody ever did. Nobody ever did. They have now been locked up by the very good people that are dealing with these issues at the National Crime Agency and the wonderful people that now run Rotherham, both politically and officer level. But you see, it haunts me. I haven't even written all of that on here. It haunts me that we didn't, we didn't talk about it. And therefore, something really bad happens. And I don't want that for my country. I don't want it for my beloved public sector. And I don't want it for the girls and the boys that are growing up here. Look also where that got Rotherham Metropolitan <coughs> Borough Council's reputation. It's still in a cellar. It's still looking for the light. Sharon and the leader are amazing, amazing public servants, but they're still digging their way out of it. And one day I'm going to go back and write the story of recovery and how they recovered and why they are good people trying to do the right thing. In 2015, I was handed another tough brief that took time to get right. I looked at the issues of integration and opportunity and our most isolated communities. It was a tough project. It brought together many voices, many views, and many issues. And I spent quite a bit of time in Wales during the course of that um, integration review. It became even tougher to publish it in the light of Brexit. In the light of Brexit, I mean, to be honest, I was surprised Brexit was as tight as it was. Where what I was listening to was an awful lot of people that wanted out. Uh, but anyway, that's a different issue. It, 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 just became a lot more difficult to talk about the issue of integration because of immigration. So it was a very, very delicate report to finally get out for me. That's delicate for me, that report. <laughs> I don't know if you've read it, but it's not, most people wouldn't describe it as delicate. But what is interesting is as a great and tolerant country that wants everybody just to rub along, we almost find it impossible to counter the fact that some people don't want that. And that is very hard for us. It's a bit like you think if you open enough youth clubs, you might deal with crime. Nah, nah. It's a bit like Bojo. If he thinks he opens up enough prisons, does he think, does he think that's going to put knife crime down? No, 
no, no, no. These things are much more difficult. There was such an irony, uh, uh, I think it was either yesterday or the day before, when the BBC ran two stories in parallel. The one that went out every half hour is that finally the Department of Education has decided to issue some guidance to all head teachers in the country around the issue of same-sex relationships and how it should be taught. They've taken their time. This has driven me insane, but they have finally done it. On the same news cycle, they talked about Strictly missing a trick because Dancing on Ice on ITV has now got, is going to get a gay couple. So in one little moment, I thought, wow, there's a whole bit of the world that really does think we're all really relaxed about gay, right? Don't we? You all do, I'm sure. I hope, anyway. And you're not going to see me later. But, you know, it's like, seriously, we're all so... We think, we think we're on this slip road. We think we're on a major artery of a road and we're all moving in the same direction. No, folks. There are some people coming in on the slip road and driving right back in the opposite direction. <gasps> They're standing outside schools in the United Kingdom in a place called Birmingham saying, it's Adam and Eve, not Steve and Steve. Oh, <gasps> God, how hard is that? Because, because, of course... We have laws, don't we? We have laws that protect gay rights. We have laws that protect religious minorities. The thing that we need to be clear about, which we all find terribly uncomfortable to be clear about, is it not some pick and mix in the service station on the motorway. You can see where I was yesterday. These are the laws. You can't say, I tell you what, I'll take your religious minority one. Great, I'll have that. But I'm going to call gay people an abomination, is what they shout and chant. So I'll take one, but I won't take the other. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. The fact that MEND as an organisation is on the rise in Wales should be a worry. Ooh, ooh, yeah, really difficult. There we are, I had to get that off my chest. The point I'm trying to make is that public service is about doing the difficult stuff and doing it together. If I did that on my own, I'd be called racist and Islamophobic. Some of you might already be reaching for that. I hope you're not, because I am neither of those things. I believe in the religious minority rights, and I believe in people's right to marry the people that they love, whether they are gay, straight, or whatever. The same way I don't want this room in three years' time, to only have one person of colour in it. Because that's our country, and that's what we believe in. Homelessness isn't always solved by housing, you know, etc. Right. Privilege to stand in front of this audience this afternoon, being bonkers, I think. Privilege, because alongside many of the public, I do believe that those of you, us in the public service, wake up in the morning only to do good. And I do honestly, fundamentally believe that. That's why what Matthew said about some of... I lived through that. I lived through that when I was a charity. We had endless business people telling us how to, how to, run, our, you know, how to run our charity if it was a business. And you kind of think, I've got a woman who's got terrible teeth, terrible hair, clothes that she can only buy when somebody else you know, gives her the money to buy them. She's got 10 children. She's had the beaten out of her probably by her father, then by every man that she's ever had in the house, and the only people protecting her are the kids who are taking the doors off and putting them in the back garden. So don't tell me, McKinsey's, how to sort that woman's life out. You can f*** off with that as well. <laughs> Over a quarter of a million people took to the streets in March to protect the NHS, and so they should. It was a huge rally, very symbolic of the place the NHS holds in our hearts, including mine. And for all that I say about my lovely uh, family in, in Baglan, I do know that the people that are trying to help them are trying to help them, and they care. This month, I saw another opinion poll showing the extraordinary public support for extra taxes to do the same. On policing, I thought it was fascinating in the Tory leadership election. They couldn't throw their little checkbook at police quickly enough. Every one of them, have more, have more, have more, left, right, and centre. What I would say to those of you from the NHS and from the police, you're welcome to that. I hope you get money. You probably need it. But where's the campaign for the dinner lady, for the fireman, for the social worker, for the cleaner, 
for the care worker, for the Meals on Wheels driver, or the folk that simply empty our bins or sort out potholes. I don't see it, guys. I don't see the public sector. I was in Chicago recently, and I said to the new Democrat mayor there, she's wonderful, very, very, very sassy, fantastic East Coast woman. I said to her, every Democrat city of size in the United States has got a massive homelessness problem that's getting worse. You are giving that man in the White House every single bit of ammunition he needs to come and strip your funding. And that is exactly what he's going to do if you don't get on top of this problem. And that's my message here. The public sector has to stand together to prevent homelessness, to prevent knife crime. Prevention remains better than cure. To help older people live out their lives with the dignity that we need to get the whole system right, not just the wonderful hospice staff right at the very end. And that's our challenge to those of us who believe that the world might feel like it's gone to hell in a handbasket in the midst of what we can and do. We must claim the power to do the right thing. When everything else might feel crazy, guys, Wales has hope. You have hope. You have hope by the fact you're all here in this room today. You have hope by the fact you've got a minister sat in the room with you. There's hope here in Wales and something you can do about it. In all the roles I've either held in the third sector with homeless organisations, all my time in government, all I've ever tried to do is shine light in the dark places. And that has often meant asking tough questions and, and being a tough messenger. But I'm only here before you today because I fundamentally believe you have a fighting shot here in Wales. You are doing many things well, including the academy. You are doing many things w well here in Wales. You can only build from it. I personally believe in a hand up and not a hand out. I believe helping people stand on their own two feet and get on with their own lives, not creating a dependency on a charity or a system. I believe in people power. We all have the power and the capacity to treat someone with dignity and compassion and in so doing, help them live a better life. The extraordinary story of Grenfell is that the public ran to it to help. The public services ran to it to help. People ran into it to try and help. It's an extraordinary sale of humanity in terms of both the public and public service response. I believe in the power of love and kindness. I believe in the hope that humanity brings, and I believe in the service of others. We all have the power to help. We all have the role in creating a just and fair society, and so can you, in your work and in how you choose to do it. Wales Public Sector, I stand before you today <laughs> simply wishing you well, wishing you joy, and thanking you for all that you do already, but go and get this done and show the rest of this country that hope can literally shine out from Wales. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just, I'm just going to ask Andrew, I think, I'm just going to play something that yeah. I, I'm doing now that I'd like you all to help with as a quid pro quo. <laughs> So I did toy the idea of not putting a Scottish video up <laughs> in Wales. Um, and obviously I had subtitles done for you because <laughs> I don't know whether you could understand a word they were saying. I couldn't. Now, the serious side, though, is that that guy, the founder, came to me about six months ago and said, I want to go global. He's like one of these young people that you just look at them and think, you take the world over because you're great mate and so Josh Littlejohn and his uh, girlfriend set up four cafes in Edinburgh called Social Bite and it's a really sweet story basically they they opened a cafe for no purpose apart from making money and homeless people kept coming in and so he said to them listen if you wash up for an hour you can have some food and that's where it all started and it went from that to a pay it forward thing where people put money in, you buy your own sandwich, you buy someone else. And as long as the pot has money in it, they'll hand out sandwiches and people come in. And now I think something like two thirds of their staff in these places 
our, um, our formerly homeless people. So it was great. It's a lovely beginning. He's very humble. And now he wants to go global, so he rings me. Anyway, so we are now doing this campaign in... We've got 52 cities all over the world. We're doing it in Cardiff, in the grounds of Cardiff Castle. We're doing it in Newport. In Newport, it's in Rodney, Rodney Parade. Uh, so... It's going to be huge, the one in Cardiff, and I think it's really important that this is a global act of solidarity on the 7th of December. People sleep out. You can do it in your own back garden. You can do it in your own place. You can do host your owns, or you can join one of these big ones. But we want to raise $50 million, uh, and we will spend half of that goes local so the local homelessness charities here that are involved get that half and the other half is going to go global where we will help people in the global south countries around refugees displaced people and street children our partner in the states is unicef usa and my own uh, small little thing called the institute of global homelessness we're providing the links with the united nations there's going to be a host your own in the plaza in the United Nations, um, sponsored by Dame Karen Pierce, who's our uh, consulate uh, to the to the UN. She's a wonderful woman. I've got Sue Gray, actually, ex civil servant, uh, still civil servant. Sue Gray is your ish equivalent in Northern Ireland, and so she's she just she said I'll get you Stormont Castle. So Sue Gray, I don't know how she's done this, but she's got Stormont Castle for, for the charities in Northern Ireland, which will be amazing. We've got Cardiff Castle uh, for the capital here. We've got back in Edinburgh, Prince's, Prince's Street Gardens in the, in the castle. So we've gone big on castles. And then we're in Dublin. Uh, we've got Trafalgar Square, the Oval in Dublin. We're in Trinity University, Chicago Lincoln Park, Times Square in New York. New Delhi, Bangalore, Wellington, I think Jacinta Herm may come to the one in Wellington. We've certainly got Peter Jackson, who's going to do the bedtime story uh, out of The Hobbit, which will be amazing. Uh, we're, we're getting people to come and do it here in Cardiff. I think Charlotte Church, I just adore this story. So this guy, he's amazing. He drives me absolutely insane, but he is amazing. And he basically, they realised the charity that Charlotte Church had just registered so they fa you have to put your mobile in when you register. And uh, he rings her up and he says, you know, can, can I see you? I'm, I'm going to be in Cardiff. Oh, definitely, man. So she literally now puts her slippers on. She's in the velvet. The women in the room will know what that is. She's in her, you know, weekending gear. And she just meets him in a cafe. And she says, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do it. Yeah, yeah, I'll perform if you want me to perform. So... It's just a little thing to add to your workload and lives that there is this big event. You are the public sector in Wales. If you could get behind it in any way at all, I'm getting behind Josh. I'm getting behind the charities here. I'm doing everything I can to support it. It's kind of all I'm doing at the moment, apart from when Academy Wales rings me and tells me I have to do something. Um, but please join in. It's called The World's Big Sleep Out. And if you pop that in your internet thing, you'll find us. Thank you very much again.